Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. All right, so welcome back to part 3 of lecture 17. Now that we have established that the least squares estimator are no longer efficient if you have spatial dependence in model errors and that by consequence the least squares estimators are no longer blue. So then you know uh, uh, what we do is we move on to a new uh, you know estimation strategy and to what we call as a generalized least squares estimators. So in general, you know, what we have done is we have moved from a specialized variance covariance, uh, you know, structure for model errors that is in front of your screen, which is uh, the one where the variance of each delta SI is exactly the same, which is sigma squared and the covariance between uh, these deltas uh, that, has, that is model errors at two different locations is zero. So the off diagonal elements are zero and that diagonal elements are exactly the same, which is a constant sigma squared. We have moved to a generalized variance covariance structure where we introduce non-zero of diagonal elements which are nothing but the covariance, uh, non-zero covariance between errors of, uh, you know, uh, of, of, of two different locations. When rho is greater than zero, what it is exhibiting is a positive spillover from the unobserved factors onto each location of interest. So each location of interest is getting a positive spillover from its neighbor if the neighbor is nearby, the spillover is strong, which is sigma squared rho. If the neighbor is farther apart, the spillover decreases in intensity by a factor of rho to the exponent of how far apart they are. This is a very, this is a, this is a simplistic, however, very realistic type of a spatial dependence structure. That's what you would expect in space. When you see clusters, uh, you know, in a locality uh, of, of equal, uh, you know, intensity, but as you move away, there are clusters of different intensity. So, you know, there is uh, less dependence from uh, on values that are farther apart than relative to the values that are closer together, right? So this simplistic starting point, you know, variance covariance structure is powerful enough to capture such a real world spatial uh, dependence structure. In the presence of this structure, when it is known, exactly known, when we are able to exactly write down what our rho uh, you know, a variance covariance matrix is, which is a n by n matrix, which is no surprise. We are working with n sized columns of for deltas and for r's, for p's. So basically, we have an n sized, uh, you know, column for each data set. We have n observations, and the variance covariance matrix is n by n, right? In this case, the, the GLS estimator is written as x prime omega inverse x time uh, times x prime omega inverse y. Now the beta hat is written as in a matrix form. Remember till now we have written it all in scalar form, right? Just to do a slight translation. So if, if you know, uh, if I were to write a ordinary least squares, which is the non-generalized form, you know, I will write uh, beta hat ls equals x prime x inverse x prime y. Okay, now uh, what is to be understood here is that when we move from least square to GLS, what is happening is that in my estimator, I am somehow normalizing or weighing for this omega inverse, uh, you know, matrix, right? Now, in case of least squares, I could envision doing the same. I mean, I could write, uh, you know, I could write sigma squared sigma squared i n inverse and sigma squared i n inverse as a sandwich. And what will happen is if you solve it, what will happen is that these two terms will actually cancel out. But when the matrix is a bit more complex, that is omega, this canceling doesn't happen. So the generalized least squares makes the least squares formulation a, uh, you know, uh, uh, a special case of itself, right? Now I'm going to just get rid of this sandwich form just for our convenience going forward. 
if you want to see the you know uh, 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 correspondence between the scalar form and the matrix form you can you can just uh, you know uh, 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 you can say we can just write down the scalar form and you will start to see it so beta hat 2 ls was equal to summation n equals 1 to n uh, p minus p bar x sorry r minus r bar divided by summation 1 to n r minus r bar sorry about the spelling mistake minus r bar squared ok. So, now p is my p is my y and x is my r right. So, this numerator directly corresponds to x prime y whereas the denominator directly corresponds to the x prime x inverse. So, the matrix form is just a consist concise form of data right. The matrix x what is matrix x what is matrix y all of that let us look at it within, with our example going forward. But here I just want to sort of provide you a functional form for beta hat gls and how it is different from the beta hat ls right beta hat gls explicitly accounts for the complex variance covariance structure which accounts for spatial dependence by the way into the estimator definition by itself ok. So, for our example right for our example that is you know p s n equals beta 1 beta 2 r s n plus delta s n uh, with covariance delta u delta v uh, equaling uh, 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 sigma squared rho u minus v where rho is between 0 and 1. So, it is positive but less than 1 greater than 0 right. So, it is a positive spillover if rho were negative and it were you know then it would be negative spillovers that is to say that if I see a high value at a given location in its neighborhood I am likely to see lower values. So, spatial autocorrelation can be positive as well as negative we will probably in most cases you will re you will find uh, you know cases of positive uh, autocorrelation it depends really right ok. Um, now, uh, uh, okay. So now, when I say beta hat GLS as x prime omega inverse x inverse x prime omega inverse y, what I am saying is that x is nothing but a vector of ones. That is this coefficient one and the r's ok. Now, I have data where I have data on n location. So, I have let us say location s n. So, s 1, s 2 till s n and for each location I have a value p which is let us say p 1, p 2 all the way till p n and then value till r that is r 1, r 2 till the way all the way till r n. This coefficient of beta 1, beta 1 is a coefficient of this value 1 which is a constant. So, I have an intercept which is nothing but a column of 1's. So, this fact, this 1, this column 1 is what this 1 is representing. So, we will draw it as a bold just to say it is a column vector and obviously, its size is n by 1. And so is the size of this vector r which is also n by 1. Hence, x is nothing but n by 2 and y is my vector of prices which is again a n by 1 vector right. So, y is nothing but you know p i is going from i to equals 1 to n organized as a column vector. So, y itself is a n by 1. So, what I have is a x transpose is going to be 2 by n, omega is a n by n, it is inverse, inverse of a 
a square matrix is the size of the matrix itself and x is n by 2, x prime is 2 by n, omega inverse is n by n and y is n by 1. When I multiply these, of course, you know, there is conformity. So, let, there we go. So, we have 2 by n and again, I have uh, a 2 by 2 matrix. So, the first matrix is a 2 by 2 matrix. The second matrix, let's evaluate, is going to be uh, a again 2 by n and a 2 by 1. So, the second matrix is a 2 by 1 matrix. Again, there is their conformable and the final matrix is going to be a 2 by 1, right? So, that means that beta by itself is a 2 by 1 matrix implying that it is comprising beta 1 hat GLS and beta 2 hat GLS, okay? So, I am as if I am very concisely able to, you know, summarize the solution for beta hat GLS in this 2 by 1 uh, matrix. So, we are moving away from the scalar representation to a vector representation or matrix representation, but they are really all trans, they all translate really easily, right? So, it is not like a, it is not, it is not so hard uh, uh, at the end of the day, okay? So, now, you know, okay, so we have our estimator beta hat GLS, we know that it is a random variable, why? Why? Because, you know, it is itself a function of this random variable y, which is nothing but the prices, right? X's are non-random. What is in the variance covariance matrix are non-random sigma squared and rho are, are model parameters. But what is random is y, right? So that means beta hat GLS is also random, right? Another thing is beta hat GLS is linear in y. It's very important to see that it's linear in y because all you're looking at is a constant, a constant here, a constant here. So, basically what we are looking at, you know, somehow beta hat GLS being written as a constant A times Y, right? You can reformulate this whole thing in that format and view this in this format. So, the Y is N by 1 and here I have, I'm going to have a 2 by N matrix A, where A is nothing but X prime omega inverse X inverse X prime omega inverse, okay? Interesting, uh, you know, way to view uh, these uh, objects. So, having understood that, I can write down the variance of beta hat GLS. Of course, the variance is conditional on the data that is given to me, that is R, I'm just going to use X just to be, uh, you know, uh, keep myself in the same uh, general format. This is going to be X prime omega inverse x, okay? Sigma squared is the model parameter. It's coming from right here in the variance covariance structure. I have my sigma squared. It's the same sigma squared here, right? It's a scalar entity, a constant. And inside I have x prime omega inverse x, the whole inverse, sorry about that, okay? Now let's evaluate the size of this matrix. I have 2 by n, n by n, and n by 2. So I have a uh, you know, conformable 2 by n and then finally I have 2 by 2. So, the variance of this uh, matrix is a 2 by 2. So, the variance matrix is 2 by 2, which should not be surprising because at the end of the day, it's the variance covariance matrix of beta hat GLS. So, variance of beta 1 hat GLS is, is the and variance of beta hat 2 GLS are the uh, you know, the, 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 the diagonal elements and the off diagonal elements are nothing but the covariance of beta hat 1 GLS and beta hat 2 GLS, okay? This is a symmetric matrix because the covariance of, a diff, you know, the flip order which is covariance of beta 2 hat and beta 1 hat is exactly same as covariance of beta 1 hat comma beta 2 hat, right? So, this is exactly the same here. So, covariance of beta 2 hat and beta 1 hat. Okay, now, so we are done, right? So if we, if we have a spatial dependence, a structure with spatial dependence, rather than working with beta hat LS, that is the ordinary least squares, we should work with beta hat GLS, which is the generalized least squares format. However, there is a slight issue, right? There is a slight issue. The issue is that the above formulation 
is assuming the knowledge of omega, right? This above formulation has assumed, has assumed the knowledge, the knowledge of omega. However, in real world, you know, cases in real world situations, we may not know no omega. In fact, we will not know omega a priori, right? However, you know, in most applications, we will not know omega a priori, okay? In such a case, in such a scenario, you know, we have to, you know, back out omega from the data itself. We suspect spatial dependence. So we know there is a general, there, is, there might be a general, uh, you know, variance covariance structure going on. We are also aware that if there is a general variance covariance structure going on with the non-zero of diagonal elements or even perhaps, you know, non-constant diagonal elements, um, then, you know, we know for a fact that least squares is not going to be as efficient. So we must come to generalize least squares, but we do not know omega, then what do we do? Well, what we then do is called as the feasible, as the feasible generalized least squares strategy, okay? So going forward in the next sort of slide, we are going to start looking at an example of how do you implement the generalized least squares estimation when in fact you are not aware of the exact omega spatial dependence structure through omega, that, which is the variance covariance matrix, okay? Okay, so I am going to sort of title this slide as the feasible generalized least square strategy in the presence of spatial dependence, okay? So say, say we have data which looks like the following. Let's say we have data on P, which is the prices. We have data on the spaciousness of uh, this housing entity at location N, which is R. And we have data on public amenities, let's say, which is A. Okay, so of course, you know, we have price of house, right? We have the spaciousness or the number of rooms index, and we have a public amenities, amenities index. You know, this could be, you know, quality of schools in a neighborhood or you know, that is attributable to that particular house in question, uh, you know, uh, uh, public parks, you know, people care about parks when they buy homes, they care about school quality around that area, etc. and etc. Okay. Now we are, you know, and we are interested in the following model. In estimating the following in estimating the following regression model, okay? So we have P S N equals beta one. So I have the intercept beta two R S N plus beta three A S N and finally the model error delta Sn, right? Such that we know that Sn is basically locations S1, S2, and keep going till S capital N. All of these are in the second uh, two-dimensional real space, right? And we also know that this is not the complete model. The complete model is that we have covariance of delta at Si and delta at Sj right, where, you know, I could go from 1 to N and J could go from 1 to N is a general variance covariance matrix omega, right? So here, what's happening is that we suspect, 
we suspect spatial dependence in data, dependence in housing prices, right? Because you know we live in the real world. So if we see housing prices with you know, higher priced houses located in a cluster together and you know lower priced houses uh, located in another cluster at a different location, then we know that prices exhibit spatial dependence. Now, when we have specified the systemic portion of this model, we have not specified spatial dependence in any way. So where is it all going to be? It's going to all reside in the error term, something that we could not or did not, you know, account for in the given model, right? So as an analyst, you know, I suspect, you know, as an analyst, we suspect that there will be spatial dependence in housing prices, right? But we do not know, we do not know the exact form of it. Right, exact, we don't even know the approximate form of it. So we must use the data because my data exhibits it, then I must be able to back it out from the data, right? That is called as the FGLS strategy. So we will study this strategy in steps. So step one, okay. Step one is run the least squares regression for estimating the price PSN as a function of RSN and ASN with intercept. Okay, so we don't know omega, so we can't really write the beta, we can't really evaluate beta hat GLS. So all we are left with is beta hat LS. That is, you know, we get to our beta hat LS, which is X prime X inverse X prime Y. Remember, X now is one, which is a N by one vector. We have R, which is again a N by one vector vector just like data in an Excel column and then we have A which is again an n by 1 vector, okay. So x by itself is n by 3 and y is nothing but the price vector which is n by 1 and so y is also n by 1. So beta hat ls is made up of 3 by n and n by 3, so overall 3 by 3 inversed, which is 3 by 3, times 3 by n and n by 1, so I am looking at a 3 by 1, they are conformable, perfect, I have finally a 3 by 1 vector, this is a 3 by 1. So what I have been able to back out is a beta 1 hat least squares, beta 2 hat least squares, and beta 3 hat least squares. Now note, note that the beta hats, beta 1 hat least squares, beta 2 hat least squares, and beta 3 hat least squares are still unbiased, okay? We, we have established in this lecture, at the beginning of this lecture, that you know, even when there is spatial dependence, even when there is heteroscedasticity of the form of spatial dependence in data, it doesn't affect the unbiasedness property of a blue estimator, right? So it's still unbiased. So we are, uh, we are good to go as using beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat, and beta 3 hat as good guesses of true beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3, right? So using these, I'm going to propose that we obtain we obtain delta hat, sorry, Sn as Psn minus beta 1 hat Ls, beta 2 hat Ls R at location Sn minus beta 3 hat Ls times A at location Sn, okay? So I can evaluate Basically, you know, I can evaluate it at each location. So, you know, we know that Sn is as all S1, S2, all the way to S capital N. So I have 
a very good guess of also model residuals that is the, 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 the difference between the predicted value, the predicted value and the true value, right? So this is the true value, true price, which we observe in the data. And this here is my predicted value, right? This gives me, now because beta hats are good to go, they are good guess. So then, so is a predicted price, a good guess, because it's just a linear function, right? Uh, and so if I deduct this predicted price, which is a good guess from the actual price, I get a very good guess of delta, which is delta hat SI. This is all happening with the least squares estimator, which we are, we can do, we can work with, you know, quite efficiently without even, uh, you know, uh, worrying about the omega structure. So we suspected there is omega, we suspected there is omega, we don't know it, so we are doing what we can do best, that is we can run the least squares estimator. The least squares estimator is falsely, falsely assuming that omega is sigma squared i n. We know that, as an analyst I am aware of that. But with that in mind, I know I can still back out beta hats, which are unbiased in nature, right? So with these beta hats, I will now back out delta hat, you know, s n. The second step, step two, is I must evaluate the stationarity, the stationarity of, uh, you know, delta hat Sn, okay? Now I want to evaluate the, this, this, you know, uh, stationarity of delta hat S n because why because we are going to we will employ them employ delta hats to uh, evaluate spatial dependence through a variogram model. So in the next step, at step three, you know, I'm going to say that plot an experimental variogram, okay? And for a variogram, we are well aware that we need intrinsic stationarity. We are well aware what is stationarity. We know that if we don't have stationarity, we can't really define a variogram. We also know that if we can get to the variogram, we will have backed out the data-driven spatial dependence structure that we really, really need to get to omega, okay? Now, so, so that's why, you know, before we go on to jump on to step three, we should take a step back and evaluate whether, you know, my delta hats are stationary. At the minimum, I should worry about you know, can there be regimes of different mean values of these error terms uh, given the data I have? Can there be some kind of spatial trend that I should filter out? So if the data are, you suspect them to be non-stationary, you have to first create this filter, construct this filter, which you will deduct from the delta hat values. And then finally, the residuals that you work with, you will then estimate a variogram. So I'm going to assume in step two that you have assessed that we have assessed that the delta hat values are stationary and we are going to move forward with that knowledge, okay? Again, stationarity is a decision and it's not a hypothesis. Please go back and refer to the lectures where we studied stationarity. Okay, we are going to plot an experimental variogram for delta hat essence, okay? Um, that is to say that I will calculate two gamma h which is going to be nothing but one over the count of values separated by count of pairs, location pairs separated by a lag, lag of h. And I'm going to go from i equals one to n of h. This is the set that consists of all the pairs, location pairs separated by a value h, a lag, lag h, delta hat s n minus delta hat s n plus h, right, square. We have seen this, we have seen this, you know, multiple times. We will again see it very soon because you're going to get to the hands-on exercise 
you know, in, uh, in a couple of, uh, you know, lectures. So, we are coming to the, the variogram, experimental variogram, the variogram cloud and so on and so forth, right. If you want a little bit more familiarity, well, we had plotted, you know, the variograms, we had seen the variogram cloud and basically, you know, you look at, you are looking at something like this, right. So, you are, you are looking at these variogram values at different levels of, you know, lag. So, you vary h, you know, h itself is a variable. It's a spatial lag, right? So with this H, you figure out, you know, you can figure out uh, some very important properties. It's to say that uh, to any value, its nearer values are highly, you know, they are highly correlated or, or you know, highly, there is high degree of covariance. And as we sort of, sort of leave that location, the covariance dies out, eventually, you know, uh, 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 reducing to a large scale variation in the data where we have nothing to learn from in the no spatial correlation regime or range, okay. Uh, step four is going to be, is going to be natural. I'm going to fit a variogram, variogram model, right? So we saw variogram models. You can refer to the lecture notes. We looked at the spherical variogram model. We looked at the exponential model and several others. So I'm just going to leave it at that, right? All of this is doable through a software. So a variogram, we know how to estimate a variogram, uh, you know, theoretically. Now, you know, we will, and the hands-on exercise will actually, we will be able to estimate the variogram model, right? So when you, when you do that, you obtain what is called as the range. You obtain the cell and you obtain the nugget. You know, typically we obtain these entities. The range is nothing but the extent of spatial dependence in data, okay. SIL is the large scale variance. Skill is the large, uh, large scale variance and nugget is the micro scale variance or variation variance, okay? These parameters now start to ring a bell of how omega will look like. So omega, which is the unknown, which is what I'm after, right? This is the unknown variance covariance that we are after. Is this omega? Now, SIL is going to be large scale variance. So, SIL is something that should fill up my, you know, SIL uh, 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 is something that should fill up my, uh, you know, the diagonals. The range is where the extent of spatial dependence. So, if for any h greater than 0, let's say there is no spatial dependence, let's say we have a model you know, where it's a special case, but you know, the, the variogram shape is such that it just dies out after leaving H very quickly, right? In such a scenario, you will have where a case where off diagonal elements will be zero because that's what spatial dependence is telling us. If we know that after a certain point, you know, starting from S1, after a certain point, after the range, you know, the range, you know, there is no spatial dependence, so all the fat, all the covariance factors will be zero. The ones that are non-zero can also be backed out from the variogram model, okay? So we are now starting to fill in this omega from what we have learned here uh, in step four. So let's do that as step five. Step five is just, we are saying evaluate the data-driven uh, variance, covariance uh, matrix, and we are going to call it omega hat because it's a data-driven, uh, you know, uh, 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 device. Omega hat is now going to be C0. C0 is the cell, right, the large scale variation. It's going to be C0s, C0s, C0s. 
and here I have C S1 S2, C S1 S3, keep going C S1 S n. Okay. Uh, let me just okay. Okay. Now C S2 S1, C S2 S3, all the way C S2 S n. Similarly, I can fill these up C S n S1, C S n S2, keep going till C0, and that is how my variance covariance matrix will look like. Where we know that the value gamma h that we have evaluated from the model in step 4, right, from step 4, this value is equal to C0 minus C h. I can write this as or gamma S1 minus S2, right, I can say S i and S j, just generalize this, equals C0 minus C S i and S j, nothing but the covariogram, the covariance between values at locations S i and S j, where we know that i goes from 1 to n and j similarly goes from 1 to n. So, the variogram provides me a data driven analog of omega, right. If you want to sort of, you know, get a refresher of where this matrix is, you can refer to the redundancy, refer to the redundancy matrix, matrix in your notes from uh, when we covered Kriging estimator, the spatial interpolation estimator. Okay, we explicitly wrote this matrix. It is called as a redundancy matrix and we even called it R. Okay, so you can go back and look at R, it is exactly the same matrix that we have used for spatial interpolation. The beauty here is that now we are integrating the same idea that we used for spatial interpolation into spatial regression and we are getting away with the inefficiency of our least squares estimators by doing so. Okay, so as step 6, I am going to have, I am going to evaluate what are called as the feasible, the feasible GLS, that is what was feasible given the data. We did not know the exact omega structure. Okay, estimator as beta hat FGLS equals x prime omega hat inverse x inverse x prime omega hat inverse y and the variance of beta hat FGLS is given as x in transpose omega hat inverse x, the whole thing inversed, right. So, these are called as the feasible generalized least squares <laughs> estimators. They are unbiased and they are efficient in the presence of spatial dependencies in, uh, in the uh, uh, model errors. So, uh, beta hat FGLS is unbiased and efficient in the presence of, in the presence of uh, 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 spatial dependence in, uh, 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 in the model errors. Okay, this is very interesting. As a last, you know, bit of this particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, lecture, we can evaluate the size of this beta hat matrix. So we have a k by n. K is the number of regressors. Here it was k equals three, right? For special case, k equals three. For our special example, special case example, right? I'm going to say that this is n by n. This is n by three. Oh, sorry, n by k. 
So I am looking at a k by k. Here I have again a k by n, a n by n and a n by 1. So I am looking at a k by 1. So overall I am looking at a k by uh, k, k by 1. So I have a vector k by 1 which is nothing but an estimator for beta 1 hat FGLS, beta 2 hat FGLS, right, all the way till beta k hat FGLS, okay. This is a very general form and you can show, now you should show that this is going to be a k by k matrix on your own, okay. So uh, that is all I really wanted to cover in this lecture, but I guess it is very clear that variograms that we have spent so much time on and the idea of stationarity is completely integrable with the regression modeling, right. And this is very powerful because we have studied variograms at quite a length. So now we are also empowered to, to estimate efficient regression models in the presence of spatial dependence in data, okay. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this lecture uh, and I will see you next time where we will then you know, relax another assumption of our uh, of our classical regression model. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.